Okay, good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the McConnell Center and the Ordered Liberty Program at the University of Louisville, welcome. The room is full and many have joined us online. My name is Luke Milligan. I am the director of the Ordered Liberty Program. Founded at the university in 2018, the Ordered Liberty Program seeks the advanced study of our inherited legal tradition with an emphasis on five concepts. Natural law, subsidiarity, separation of powers, constitutional interpretation, and the common good. This spring, the Ordered Liberty Program is honored to co-host several keynote seminars with the McConnell Center. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Michael Grieva, professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Dr. Grieva joined the faculty of the Scalia Law School in fall 2012 after serving as John G. Searle Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specialized in constitutional law, courts, and business regulation, and served as chairman of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Prior to joining AEI, Dr. Grieva was founder and co-director of the Center for Individual Rights, a public interest law firm specializing in constitutional litigation. Dr. Grieva has served as an adjunct professor at a number of distinguished universities, including Cornell and Johns Hopkins, and has been a visiting professor at Boston College since 2004. He was awarded a PhD and a Master of Arts in Government by Cornell University. Dr. Grieva also earned a diploma from the University of Hamburg in Germany. A prolific writer, Dr. Grieva is the author of nine books, including The Upside Down Constitution, published by Harvard University Press in 2012. He is a frequent speaker for professional and scholarly organizations and has made many appearances on radio and television. In addition, Dr. Grieva has provided congressional and state legislative testimony. He's consulted in federal agency proceedings and has provided litigation services in over 30 cases including matters before the U.S. Supreme Court. His talk for this evening is titled, Federalism Among States. <clears throat> Dr. Grieva, on behalf of the McConnell Center and the Ordered Liberty Program, I want to thank you for joining us. At this time, please help me welcome Dr. Grieva to the lectern. Thanks much, Luke. Um, thank you very much, Luke. And, um, Thanks to Luke and Judge Walker and the Order at Liberty program um, and Gary Gregg and the uh, McConnell Center for having me. It's my, not my first rodeo here, my second go around and I'm always pleased to be back provided I don't stumble over these cables <laughs> in the process. Um, federalism among the states uh, is my chosen topic. We usually think of federalism as sort of a matter of balance between the federal government and the states. That's where all the conflicts are. Um, but federalism entails not only that vertical conflict, but also horizontal conflicts between and among states. And I'm sure you can think of examples, right? So certain governors sent plane loads and bus loads of immigrants northward um, to Chicago and uh, New York City. Um, California bans the import of products that aren't really produced the way the state wants them to be produced. That includes pork, foie gras, eggs, above all, energy. Day in and day out, uh, blocks of state attorneys general, blue states versus red states litigate against one another uh, in federal court. Um, post Dobbs, the abortion decision, states that hold themselves out as abortion havens want to advertise their services in more restrictive states. <clears throat> and when a national drugstore chain says, um, we're actually not going to sell abortion pills in states where that's unlawful, uh, Governor Newsom um, yanks their contract. And the list goes on and on and on. How should one think about that constitutionally? Um, half an hour, 35 minutes, isn't enough to give you the full-blown theory, but it's enough to sort of provoke 
um, not you personally, but what I hope um, is a sort of fruitful engagement. So my key point is this, and I start, um, you know, on a contentious point. The Supreme Court, uh, over the past decades, not just you know, 10 years, but you know, 40, 50, 60 years, has just gotten just every case dealing with horizontal federalism questions wrong. Not by accident, but on account of a jurisprudence that makes the judges and justices think about this stuff in a very bad way, in a way that's disconnected from the Constitution and from real world traditions. Um, this argument, I am afraid, will involve a fair amount of heavy breathing about the Constitution. Um, worse yet, it requires engagement with something called conflicts of law. Um, what that means is federalism will have a lot of situations where people get into spats or con disputes across state lines and in situations where more than a single state's law can apply whose law is going to apply and who has jurisdiction over what. Okay, that's called conflicts of law. Um, that field is famously known as the insane asylum of the American legal profession. Um, I do in fact teach that course on a regular basis and you may conclude I belong there. Um, but I hope to persuade you that we can actually try to make some sense of this provided we can keep the Constitution in mind. Who cares about this stuff? And why now? Um, you know, federalism conflicts along horizontal lines as well as vertical lines are neither new uh, nor unexpected, right? Unitary, centralized systems, Denmark, France, they don't have these problems. Um, but we think the sort of federalism's frictional costs um, and inconveniences, you know, are worth bearing in light of the um, benefits that federalism brings in terms of innovation, variegation, competition among states. So why fret and why fret now? I'll give you three reasons. Here's the first. Um, over the past decades, interstate conflicts have become much more visceral and partisan and, what a, uh, and sectional. And what I mean by sectional is you're looking at two blocks of states, right? Blue states, um, red states, very stable, very cohesive, identifiable by dominant party, with radically different business models, um, cultural commitments, and they confront each other on a bazillion issues that they think are existential. Energy policy, immigration. If you want to hold the country together, there has to be some accommodation, some way of allowing states with those commitments to live with one another and to get along. That gets me to my second point. The place where we used to find that accommodation used to be the Congress, right? And these compromises became embodied in a bazillion uh, what we call cooperative federalism programs. Medicaid, education programs, various regulatory programs. Okay? We don't have that Congress anymore. Congress mostly delegates, and federalism now comes from the executive. And it doesn't come from some expert agency. It comes from the White House, right? It's the Biden student relief plan. Nobody knows who the Secretary of Education even is, right? So regardless of partisan in, uh, identity, the presidential executive directs these massive streams of funding uh, and creates very ambitious regulatory uh, regimes, all gerrymandered for the benefit of whatever party happens to be in power and occupy the White House. That cannot be good, okay? Um, the institution where I teach, we believe that monopoly is always bad in private markets as well in public markets. That gets you to the third point. If control and rivalry don't, st don't come from Congress, they have to come from someplace else, that has to be the federal courts. And the glitch is that those tribunals, emphatically including the Supreme Court, 
have almost no idea uh, of horizontal federalism problems, what they look like, what they are like, uh, and they have no legal and constitutional materials to handle them. So the one institution that is supposed to produce and protect federalism among states has effectively abdicated. That's a contentious proposition. Not everyone will agree with it, not even at the end of this talk, so I'll break it down into three propositions. Here they are. Um, if you look at the Constitution, it establishes a coherent federalism order, vertically and horizontally. I'll go through that. The court has no recollection of that structure and at times has uh, compromised what little is left of it. I mean, the court's basic mistake, I think, is to think of federalism as entirely a matter of balance between the federal government and the states. And once you lock yourself into that way of thinking, you're going to miss the sort of horizontal dimension um, almost entirely. And the third point is uh, it would be good for the court to reassert horizontal federalism principles, but that won't come easy. And one of the chief obstacles to that rediscovery, paradoxically, is sort of what I call clause-bound textualism and originalism. Okay, so that's the program. And as always we do, we begin with the structure and text of the Constitution. Okay. So, the Constitution organizes federalism horizontally and vertically. Vertically, you know, there's one ordering rule. It's called the Supremacy Clause, Article 6, Section 2. What it is, is a brutal choice of law clause. In cases of conflict, federal law prevails. End of debate. Right? That's the basic principle. The, uh, the Constitution speaks much more eloquently to horizontal federalism. Okay, so most of these provisions are found in Article 1, Section 10, and then in Article 4. So here they are, Article 1, Section 4, the Contracts Clause. No state shall make any law impairing the obligation of contracts. That's a horizontal federalism rule. What they were afraid of um, <coughs> was debtor relief laws, so as to, you know, exploit um, creditors from out of state. Banks in New York is what they had in mind. The compact clause, no state shall make any compact with another state without congressional consent. What they were afraid of was that two or more states might gang up against the third. The import-export clause, you can't have import-export duties by single states. The tonnage clause is sort of a backup clause to that. You can't tax this, the ship's tonnage either. Article 4, the full faith and credit clause, commands each state to give full faith and credit to each sister state's um, records, proceedings, and public acts. We will have to see what that means. The privileges and immunities clause, not to be off Article 4, not to be uh, confused with the privileges and immunities clause of the 14th Amendment. What it is, is basically it's a non-discrimination clause, okay? Whatever privileges and immunities you state give your own citizens, you have to extend the same privileges to any and immunities to any out-of-stater. No discrimination. And then there's a delivery clause. So, if you have somebody in your state who has committed a crime in another state, you have to deliver him, okay? And then there's in Article 3, um, the Constitution provides for federal court jurisdiction over all of this. I have three points about this, okay? It, this is not all the clauses. Oops, yeah. Um, there are more, okay? <laughs> I just listed a few, uh, enough to illustrate that the founders took this seriously because they had to. Three points about this. First, this isn't a grab bag of clauses that you can sort of parse one by one. It's a coherent structure that rests on certain principles. Non-aggression, non-discrimination, comedy um, among equal territorial states, 
that have some measure of political integrity. None of this was exactly new um, because it came from the law of nations and the Articles of Confederation had sort of the equivalent of these clauses previously, except they weren't enforceable. Okay, but the Constitution makes this enforceable. I'll have another word about that. So, second, it's a mistake to think of federalism in one direction and that has nothing to do with the other direction. No, these two are linked. Okay, just about every federal I mean, every vertical federalism case is also a horizontal federalism case and vice versa. So think of commerce clause statutes, right? They regulate relations between the feds and the states, but also between and among states. Um, preemption cases where federal law preempts, pre precludes the application of state law. They frequently, or federal law frequently tries to preclude, bar, block, bad stuff that states might otherwise do to each other, right? Or think of climate change cases. Every EPA regulation that comes out will disproportionately affect states, either carbon producing state or carbon intensive states or other states, okay? Uh, you may think that what the Supreme Court calls special solicitude for standing, that is, states have an easier time to get into federal court than anybody else, that that is a pro-state measure until you realize that, oops, in any given case, the other half of states, you know, scream bloody murder and don't want it, right? And the same is true with injunctions issued by federal court that apply across the country. And on and on it goes, right? So one way or another, you cannot make sense of federalism as a whole until you keep these two things together. Finally, and this is important, practically all the, 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 the provisions that are listed earlier, the compact clause, the contract clause, da 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 da, privileges, immunities clause, you could easily, as a constitutional matter, leave that to Congress, right? Congress has copious powers, all of them in Article I, right? And pursuant to those powers, Congress could prohibit states affirmatively from discriminating against out of state citizens, <coughs> from imposing import-export duties, right? If that is not commerce, I don't know what is, right? So why write all that junk into the Constitution if Congress can at any moment prohibit it? And the reason for that is that Congress is deliberately built to be slow and dilatory, okay? But these things, interstate discrimination, compacts, laws impairing the obligation of con uh, contract to the founders' minds, those things were so dangerous that you didn't want to leave them to Congress. What you want to do is make those provisions those and prohibitions self-enforcing. That is to say, enforceable by private litigants in federal court. In other words, the founders expected the federal courts and not Congress to be the first line of defense when it comes to horizontal federalism, okay? That was the easy part, now it comes the mess. Um, let me say a few words about the modern court. Um, as I mentioned, this entire structure is dead and gone. We don't have it anymore, okay, and over the past for decades, originalist judges and justices have sort of assisted in the burial. My principal example for that is something called the Dormant Commerce Clause. What is that? So the Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate commerce among the states, okay? The Dormant Commerce Clause is the notion that the Commerce Clause, of its own force, prohibits certain state laws even when Congress has not said a peep, okay? That's the dormant commerce laws. And traditionally we have thought that the laws that are prohibited by the dormant commerce clause are state laws that discriminate against interstate commerce or regulate on an extraterritorial basis. That just follows from uh, the structure of the Constitution. No justice in our entire history ever doubted that. Over the first 150 years, 
of our existence, um, the commerce clause, the dormant commerce clause, that's the reason why America rose to be an economic powerhouse because you broke down state barriers to interstate commerce, right? And so we could operate a capitalist system on a, on a continental scale. Nobody ever doubted it until 1987 um, when Justice Scalia in a dissent then um, said this entire construct is illegitimate, it's unconstitutional, it's a textual, okay? And that notion has since gained support from Justice Gorsuch, Justice Thomas, Chief Justice Roberts. I get the originalist point, okay? The supposedly textual point. It's a grant of power to Congress, not a prohibition against states. I believe that's wrong, but I get it. I can follow the thought. The howler is that none of, virtually none, of the textual horizontal pro uh, federalism provisions, the ones that are actually in the text, the ones that an originalist should like, they're not enforceable either. Okay, here are a few examples. Contract clause, unenforceable. Import-export clause covers only stuff that really comes from China or Krautland, uh, Germany, and, uh, but not in internal shipments. Compact clause, unenforceable. No contract, no compact needs congressional consent according to the Congress. Full faith and credit clause, yeah, you can enforce it as to recognizing judgment, that is to say, <clears throat> you know, th there's a state, ju there's a judgment in one state, will that be recognized in the next state over? Yes, under the full faith and credit clause. Not as to public acts uh, anymore. I can explain all these horror cases, but I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> Privileges and immunity clause. You can discriminate against corporations all you want, at least as a matter um, uh, of uh, the privileges and immunities clause. Why is that? Because corporations don't count as citizens for purposes of that clause. Okay. Whoops. <clears throat> okay. Um, some of the precedents here obviously long predate sort of the rise and shine of modern day originalism. Uh, but the fact is I cannot think of a single case over the past uh, 40 years that has cast the slightest doubt on any of this. Uh, I can think of, and I cannot think of a single opinion that pays any heed to sort of the, the dynamics of horizontal federalism as it's now being played out in real life, and that is true even when those dynamics stare you in the face. So the classic case is a case called Massachusetts versus EPA, decided in 2007. A coalition of states, all of them blue states, yes, led by Massachusetts, insists that the EPA regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. 15, 16 other states, including predictably this state, okay, scream bloody murder because they know what's coming down the pike. The Supreme Court says, I mean, first, you know, the case stands for the proposition um, that there's a greenhouse gas exception to every known principle of administrative law in America. It's second stands for the proposition um, that states deserve special solicit solicitude. So come on in, Massachusetts, even if nobody else can complain about this stuff. And then they say it's a pollutant. No idea of the interstate, they thought this was pro-state. Okay, despite the, the, the state opposition, right? And they had not the foggiest idea that what they would unleash is sort of the carbon wars. And since then, there have been dozens and dozens of cases. They come up time and again over the same questions again and again, and the Supreme Court still doesn't get it. Uh, I'll give you one more illustration. This one less incendiary um, and more esoteric, but equally telling. It's just quote, right? So 
is a code. So conflicts law has two pieces. I mean, the two pieces that matter is conflicts of law, whose, whose law governs in cases of conflict. That's called choice of law. And then which court or courts have jurisdiction, power to adjudicate this particular dispute. Those are these two pieces, okay? Here's the first on choice of law. There's a quote from a case. We decline to follow the constitutional course would be a fine epitaph on some justice's tombstone. Your own personal jurisdiction. Mm, I don't know what to do with this case. Hopefully lower courts and litigants will um, tell us how to figure this out. Unanimous opinion also. I mean, sorry, unanimous decision, multiple opinions. Okay? Yeah, well, appellate lawyers, litigants, appellate judges, <clears throat> they face these tangles day in and day out. And they are desperately waiting for the Supreme Court to give them some sense of direction. Where are we supposed to be going with this stuff? So this is kind of a prisoner's dilemma. I'll come back to that. Okay? But I want to spend a few minutes on trying to explain this. Um, this paradox, this inattention, originalist, textualist, inattention to text structure and so forth. Never mind real world dynamics when it comes to horizontal federalism. So, I mean, take one step back. How problematic is this uh, in real life? I mean, in a certain perspective, you can say, look, Grieva, you're obsessing needlessly, right? It's not all that important. I mean, friction among the states, that's amply compensated by its benefits. We can all move to states that we like, okay? And people do with a vengeance. That's worth a lot. Okay, so you can put up with a lot of nonsense. Uh, as Adam Smith uh, famously remarked, there's a lot of ruin in the nation. And um, this nation, as rich and lucky as it is, can live with a lot of it. Just as we can live at the end of the day with, you know, a burgeoning administrative state that often makes our lives a little more or a lot more on onerous and complicated. Note the irony here. On the administrative state, this court has gone, gone to town like nobody's business, right? So opinion after opinion, sort of teams with laments about a government that has sort of leapt the constitutional bounds, ambitious theories to stem the constitutional rot, right? At times derived from the Constitution's open-ended clauses, the executive power, and then now let's go to town with that. All legislative powers here and granted. Let's go to town on that. Oh, by the way, there's a major question doctrine, right? If it's really too big, no, we not, we're not going to let the administration interpret the laws and it's, it's our business and so on and so forth, right? At all of these fronts, appellate judges, know what they, they are supposed to be doing. Litigants pick up the signals, they know what they're doing. You don't see any of that in, in horizontal federalism cases. There's some hand wringing but no sense of direction, no, deafening silence on the text and the structure. How is that even possible? Um, this part of the argument uh, is a little bit complicated and I, I hope I have managed to present it in a form that that is uh, halfway intelligible. Go back to the constitutional structure, federalism structure. What does it take to make that work on a day-to-day -day basis where there are millions of transactions of all kinds across state lines? It takes a lot of ordering rules, right? To decide which law, whose jurisdiction, and so on and so forth. None of the operative rules in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, Article 4, explain themselves, right? And the principal agent is supposed to be the federal courts, because Congress cannot do that on a day-to-day -day basis. So what law are these courts supposed to look to when they go about that task? 
Uh, the Constitution for sure, treaties, statutes, all of that is safe um, originalist ground. If you're sensible about the enterprise, you will also permit sort of constitutional common law rules, right? Um, the second holding of McCulloch versus Maryland, states cannot tax instruments of the federal government. You cannot get that from the text of the Constitution. You have to sort of understand the structure, okay? But even that doesn't do it. So it isn't enough to organize horizontal federalism. So, for example, the Constitution tells you that there must be state jurisdiction over you and that it must be territorial in some sense because states are territorial, not in the stratosphere. But beyond that, the Constitution says nothing. And you can torture the due process clause or something else all day long, it won't answer, okay? States have to give full faith and credit. What exactly does that mean, right? What exactly are the privileges and immunities with respect to which states may not discriminate? Who exactly counts as a citizen? Parse the text all day long, sort of Bostock-style originalism doesn't get you there. It just gives out, right? And neither original public meaning nor corpus linguistics, however useful all that stuff may be, will give you an answer. It won't get you anywhere near doctrine that makes sense of this universe. So what did courts look to prior to horizontal federalism's demise? And the answer is, depending on what you count it, uh, call it, it's the same thing, the law of nations, the general common law. Okay, it's out there. And we know how to decide conflicts cases. Where did courts get the power to declare that law? Answer, the judicial power of the United States vested in Article 3. Okay, if that power, the judicial power of the United States means anything at all, it means the power to decide conflicts cases in the same way in which the Westminster Court, and for that matter, the colonial courts had always decided these cases under the law of nations, the law of conflicts, which is part of that. Okay, remember that that is how Alexander Hamilton justifies the power of judicial review in the first place. Right? He says, look, these are conflicts cases. Between statute and the Constitution, that's a conflicts case. Right? Between federal law and state law, that's a conflicts case. Why should courts stop deciding the way they've always decided cases just because one of the rules appears in the Constitution. That makes no sense, and boom, there you have it, there's judicial review. Mind you, that's a special case because very little conflicts law back then was constitutional law, constitutional law and interpretation. Here's the constitutional norm, let me interpret it. It didn't work that way, right? The doctrines that the common law, general common law doctrines that they had those were default rules. They operated presumptively. They didn't preempt anything, right? They operated in the absence of any congressional statute, right? And even states could adopt different rules, right? So states cannot tax federal instruments, the Bank of the United States, yeah, except when Congress wants them to or per affirmatively permits them to. So it's a default rule. States cannot discriminate against or otherwise wreck interstate commerce, unless Congress gives them that permission. So they're all presumptive, okay? Jurisdiction, venue, trans venue law, everything worked like that, okay? All that went by the boards on one day, in April, on April 24, 1938. And ever since then, we have been taught, everyone else learns this in Civ Pro, that the legal world I've just sketched for you was not just flawed, but unconstitutional. That case is called Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Okay? And what it's about is if there's no federal rule of decision that came from Congress, what law are federal courts supposed to follow? And what the court says is, the law of the state where they sit. And that means the law of, the, of whoever sues first in interstate disputes, right? The most opportunistic litigant gets to choose his or her forum 
and then the law that will apply in that state, and away we go. That way you get a lot of vertical uniformity, right? Because the federal courts can no longer depart from whatever the state law was, right? So that's all uniform. But you'll get a lot more horizontal disuniformity, interstate conflicts out the wazoo in the process, right? And so there are a bunch of famous pronouncements in the case. There is no federal general common law. The law of nations is gone. Federal courts have no power to declare substantive rules of decision in diversity cases. Diversity cases are cases among parties from different states. Right? Congress must go first, right? Despite the fact that uh, it's plain from the structure, courts were supposed to play a role in this, right? And this is not in the case, but this is the plain uh, implication of the case, right? Vertical conflicts are evil, we can't have them. Uh, horizontal conflicts count for nothing. And actually they may be good. So if plaintiffs, lawyers, and plaintiffs can sort themselves into the law of the most favorable state and then sue in hellhole jurisdictions, that's really, really bad for interstate commerce. But maybe it's, it's sort of the only form of socialism of which this country is capable. Okay? Seriously? Susanna Sherry, the grand dame of American federal courts law. This is the worst decision of all time. Grant Gilmore. It cannot possibly mean what it seems to be saying. Steve Sachs, Harvard Law School. Rejecting here is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? Um, Right? I think they, the, the critics are right. If, if that hasn't come through yet, <laughs> let me repeat it. I think the critics of this decision um, are right. Uh, if you believe in Erie Railroad, you can no longer make sense of horizontal federalism. That's, and you, that's how you end up with sort of pronouncements of the we decline, we hope for guidance variety. Um, heh, fine, you hope for guidance from lower courts and litigators, but that won't come easy. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Oops. Did I miss a slide? No. Sorry. One slide got lost. Um, there are recent decisions, uh, or no, pending cases. Um, I'll say a few words about them and then I'll end on my conclusion. Um, so there's a co uh, pending case okay, called um, National Pork Producers Council versus Ross. Okay, um, arguments have been held, the justices are sitting on it. So what it's about is California has a law uh, prohibiting the import of pork unless you can certify that the pig had a pen the size of my living room, a daily shower, and a gluten-free diet from spa to table. Okay, needless to say, pork producers in Nebraska, Iowa, and so forth don't like this. Um, Here's another case, and then I'll sort of sum up. A uh, case called North Mallory versus Norfolk Southern. So Mr. Mallory is a railroad employee on North, Norfolk Southern Railroad, right? He's a Virginia citizen. The railroad is a Virginia corporation. His injury occurred into, in Virginia. Where do we want to litigate that case? Obviously, in Pennsylvania, okay, with its hellhole juries and no limit on punitive damages. Virginia has a $350,000 limit. The briefs, the corporate parties' briefs in these cases are written by very, very good lawyers, right? 
Um, but they don't give the Supreme Court a theory at all for an obvious reason. If you try to give the court a theory, you might lose votes. So what you try to do as a lawyer is you try to win this, I mean, representing a party directly, you try to win this case even if you make even more of a mess of the doctrine than it already is and if you don't move an inch forward. Okay? In both cases, there are amici who sort of know what they're doing. Um, so in the uh, pork producer's case, there's a brief written by Michael McConnell, professor, judge, now professor again, <laughs> Michael McConnell, and the entire brief is, never mind, let me explain the constitutional structure to you, all of it. And once you comprehend that, you will see this case is easy. States cannot regulate on an extraterritorial basis like that. We're out of here. Okay? By the same token, there's a brief in, in the Mallory case, and that's interesting. Um, that's written by the Virginia Solicitor General, Andy Ferguson, um, which says, look, what you're saying is that anybody can sue anywhere in the country for anything at all, so long as the cor corporation registers in the state, which it always does, because otherwise it couldn't be doing business. Whatever that is, that cannot be federalism, and contrary to your originalist protestations, that was never the law. That too is the beginning of theory. Both of these briefs leap over Erie's shadow, okay? And the authors know that very, very well. All right, but it'll be hard to sell the Supreme Court on that step, even in a piecemeal fashion, right? The more liberal justices, they've absorbed Erie's lesson. Whatever is bad for the interstate commerce of the United States is therefore good. Let's have more of it, right? That's the true and correct message of Erie Railroad. Uh, and to originalists, Erie is sort of the anti-Lochner. So Lochner, <laughs> my first year, Lochner versus New York stands for the proposition, hey, we get to make this up. And that is unacceptable, right? We can never have that. And to originalist mind, Erie stands for the proposition, we can't make things up, right? That is not what it says, and that is not how it's played out, but that's what they think, and that's the sort of true ground of their belief. And so with that, I end on my concluding propositions, right? You have to get beyond, if you want to make sense of this, you have to get beyond sort of clause-bound, narrowly textualist originalism. And for every law student in the audience and for every prospective law student uh, in the audience, I have this proposition. You can believe that the Constitution establishes a coherent federalism structure, or you can believe Erie Railroad you cannot believe these two things at the same time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.